Yeah, what else did you notice about that, that, that shepherd and sheep video? Did you notice how, which sheep did he buy? The sick and the skinny ones that no one really wanted. You know, that reminds me of that Bible verse about how, how God chooses the foolish and the weak ones and the short ones. I'm saying that because I'm short. To shame the strong and, and the wise. And aren't you glad that God chooses the one that no one else would choose? Yes. You know, there's one story. You know, every young man needs a mama to make them feel like a man, you know. And my mom, that's one thing she did great. She, she's been gone 18 years now from this earth. But uh, one thing my mom always told me, she told me a story. And I've never, and it's helped, I don't even know if you know this story, Melissa. You're going to know something about me the first time the Facebook's learning about me and everybody else in this room. It's pretty amazing. My mom and dad were 16 years old when they got married. And uh, they had dropped out of high school. And uh, I think 17 years old, my mom got pregnant with me. So she was 18 years old when I was born. And so they didn't have any money. My, my dad was looking for a job as a part-time welder. You know, he joined the Army later. And they did the best they could. But my grandma made sure I was born in a Northside Hospital in Atlanta. That's a big deal to be born in Northside Hospital. I don't remember it. But my mom tells the story. There is an African-American nurse. Whenever I was born and she was holding me, she, goes, she started worshiping. She goes, oh, this one's got the shine. This one's got the shine. And if you're not from the South, you don't know what that means. But when somebody says someone's got the shine, that means that God has picked that one. And it's really cool because uh, God picked me. You know, a kid from a family that no one else would have picked, and I, no one knew I was near I hope my stepdad's watching this. I, I, I forgive you. I'm just kidding. It's not your fault. But the 70s, they didn't give an eye test. And I, they didn't know I couldn't see that well. So I, because of it, I couldn't talk. I mean, I couldn't talk at all. So I, I rode um, you know, a special bus to school, and I couldn't talk or anything like that. I was like four or five years old. I fell in the second grade until they put glasses on me. Go figure. So again, I, I was always that kid, always trying to catch up. But God picks the, the guys like that. God picks all of us that no one else would pick. And what does he do? He doesn't just pick you, but he heals you and makes you strong. He makes you a new creation. You see, he's such a good shepherd that I think the reason why he picks people like you and I is because I think it just makes him show off his work a little bit more. He's like, look what I do with that one. And people go, wow, you're a really good guy. He's like, yeah, I know I am. Look what I can do with you. So we should all have a good sense of humor about ourselves because God, he, boy, he, he, pick, he picks the, the roughest ones, and boy, he makes something beautiful, doesn't he? Yeah. So everybody says he's making me beautiful. Making beautiful. Roger's making you beautiful. Yeah, that's right. So I started really thinking about that, and I started thinking this whole idea, well, if he's a shepherd, then we're sheep. And you know, sheep... It says in the boy, where show that one verse up there. That one about sheep choosing their own way. Show that first verse, where The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all of us, if I say all of us, all of Facebook, us. say it with me, all of us. I heard you. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wickedness of us all, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoings, to fall on Him instead of us. Who is Him? Christ. Jesus, right. So all of us like sheep, mindless sheep, have just gone our own little way, and every single one of us ends up where? Lost, or for lunch, or something else. <coughs> And sheep, the thing about being a sheep, you've got to be okay with, uh, sheep don't have any great skills of their own to survive in the wild. Yeah, I've never seen the National Geographic show, and I used to watch them, because I thought it was really cool when a lion would take down an antelope and rip its guts out. I thought it was the best, best thing in the world to see that. And uh, it should terrify me as I look back on it. But I've never seen a, a National Geographic show where a sheep has attacked anything. Have you, have you seen that? You ever seen a Melissa, have you seen a sheep ever prouncing you know, upon a house cat or something? No, they, they're pretty helpless. So what do sheep do all day? Eat. What else? Sleep. They like to hang out together, right? And I like the fact that it says 
each one of us like sheep. So sheep without a shepherd are dead. Sheep without a shepherd are helpless. And so you can kind of hear that, that every one of us is totally helpless through we life trying to figure it out on our own. That God never intended for us to figure this out. He never intended for us to figure out our career path. He never intended for us to figure out what we're going to do tomorrow. He never intended for us to worry about how we're going to feed ourselves, clothe ourselves. Do you hear what I'm saying? God never intended on us to be little John Wayne Christians out there and go, you know, be a man or be a woman and be tough. No, you're a sheep. I'm a sheep. So if we're a sheep without a shepherd, we're going to do whatever seems right to us. A lot of you know what I'm talking about. Most people make decisions in life based upon what? How they, how they feel, their feelings, their moods. How else do people make decisions in life based upon what? Money. How much money is this going to pay me? What's, how else do people make decisions? Logic. Logic. What makes sense to me based upon the limited knowledge I have, right? How else do people make decisions in life? What makes them look good. What makes them look good. That's a really good one. Does this angle make my hair look fluffier or whatever? Um, how else do people, how about fear? I'm afraid of something, so I'm going to do something different, right? So fear will make decisions. And what else? How about tradition? It's from your family and upbringing. Your family and upbringing. Everybody else has done it like this. I'm a sheep and we'll follow the rest of them off the cliff, right? What else? Power. Power, right? Power. Our cameraman said power. Basically, people are heard that really loud. Power. So it's amazing how, how, how easily we guide ourselves through obligations. No one said that one, but we all, because everybody else expects me to do it. And so we make decisions in life not based upon someone leading us, but just really the wind of the air, if you will. Which way the wind's blowing, uh, popularity, uh, whatever else is doing about it, you know, whatever it is. Or can you honestly say that you're being led by God? Or do you find yourself, like most of us, using God to get us out of the situation that we wandered into? You ever done that? Well, God, you didn't leave me here, but here I am. I don't like where I am. And we say, Jesus, help me out. And he helps us out. What do we do? Back to wandering off to uh, what we were doing before. Now, there's two kinds of people I'm going to talk to you about tonight. There are some people watching this video who are simply lost. You cannot find Jesus. You're not going to find him. He's got to find you. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus will leave the 99 sheep and do what? He'll go find that one lost one. And what happens when Jesus finds that one lost sheep? He rejoices. He rejoices. He carries them, he carries them back to the community, right? And everybody throws a big party. Isn't that, what, isn't that beautiful? That, isn't that what happens when we wander off in life? We, we separate ourselves from other people? When addictions pull us aside, we, we find ourselves trapped and isolated, and we feel like we're alone and cut off from others. Isn't that, isn't that true? It's a horrible feeling. But Jesus always brings us back to relationships. He brings us back to family. He brings us to community. Well, that's what life is. That's one thing I saw in that video. That sheep need other sheep. And sheep need a strong community, right? And then we all have a tendency to go astray in fear. We have a tendency to go astray in Facebook. We, we're addicted to Facebook, right? We're addicted to Starbucks, whatever it is. And we tend to wander off all the time, and Jesus always had to bring us back. There's two people. There are those who are lost, and then there are the Christians who simply have never let Jesus lead them. Is that true? A lot of people who claim to be Christians, but they don't follow Jesus. Is that, is that bad to say? They believe in Jesus, right, Melissa? They, they'll tell you that they believe in Jesus, I go to church, I do all that, but does he lead you daily? No. Why does he need to lead me daily? I'm saved. That's good enough, right? No, and we're missing out totally. Uh, Blair, show that next verse. It says this right here is in Proverbs 19.21. It says, many, are, many plans are in a man's mind, but, in the Lord's, but it is the Lord's purpose for him that, that will stand and be carried out. God has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for Melissa. He has a purpose for Roger. He's got a purpose for Nicole. Murray, he's got a purpose for you. He's got a purpose for me. God has a purpose that, guess what he figured out his purpose for your life? God didn't, like, watch you grow up and say, you know what? 
But, you know, uh, Brittany seems really good at art. I've been watching her, and I think she'd be a good artist. And Derek, you know, Derek's a hard work, you know. I'm, I'm just watching Derek, you know, and he is so skilled at carpentry. I'm just making this stuff up. I don't know if it's true or not. It is. Hey, praise God. It's not. So, so you no, know, it doesn't do that. But that's how we do it. But God said this. Before the foundation of time, he knew you, and he already determined his purpose for your life. Does that excite anybody? And it's not part of your mental plans. In other words, this isn't for you to figure out. It's for you to follow. But what happens to a lot of us is we end up in places in life. We don't like where we are. And we say, God, either get me out of here or just leave me alone. But we don't realize that God's going, well, I've got a purpose for you. That is better than your wildest dreams. It's, it's bigger than your life. It's, it's um, you haven't messed up. You haven't messed up so bad that you can't get there. Mostly praying for me now. I can tell. Oh, sorry. But you see, God has never changed his mind on his purpose for anybody in this room. God has a purpose, and it's, it's good. It's really good. But we have to get away from our plans and through following Jesus arrive at his purpose. Does that make sense? You follow him there. You don't figure it out. You follow him. So Blair, what's that next verse? So Jesus says this. This is in John chapter 10. I want you to listen. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. Who is the thief? Satan. Satan. And he's at power, I mean, he's at work around us all the time. Would you agree? Anywhere in the world you can see where, where Satan is trying to do what? Steal from you, kill your dreams, destroy your life. Yes? Okay? But Jesus says, I came that they may have what? And enjoy life. Did you see that? Uh-oh. Jesus says, I came that they may have and enjoy. Everybody say enjoy. Enjoy. Does God want you to enjoy your life? Yes. yes. What? What I thought Christianity was sucking all the fun out of life and just trying to be obedient. No. Christianity is where you really have the fun. See, Jesus says, I came that you may have life and enjoy it. Now, how many people can honestly say, I really enjoy my life? Don't raise your hands. And truly say, I enjoy it. God wants you to enjoy life. Fully. Does that sound good? And he says, I can't admit that they may have. What's it mean to have something? It means you own it. He doesn't do the carrot thing. You know, dangling the carrot and the string in front of your life going, well, if you're trying to be a little bit more obedient here, I'll give you something else. You never get it. No, he says that life I came to give you, it's yours. It's, it's you have it. I'm not keeping it from you. It's yours. Just follow it. And you'll, you, I'll give it right to you. It's a really good deal. He says you may have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. But we don't think about that in church. We always think that God just gives you a little bit. Have you ever had those communion wafers in church? About You know that little big piece of bread like a chiclet? It's big enough to get caught in your teeth. You ever done that? A lot of us think that God's goodness is like that. God just gives you. You can't handle too much. You know, here's your ration, Melissa. Make this last for a week. No, the Bible says that God is giving you life. An abundance is more than you can hold on to. It's more than you can contain. In fact, it's so much, it's overflowing. Does that make sense? Well, we don't see that much, do we? God wants to not only give you life, but it's overflowing. It's really a super abundance. And then Jesus says what? I am the what? Good shepherd. The good shepherd does what? He lays down his life for his sheep. So what kind of shepherd is Jesus? A good one. So does, does Jesus give people cancer? No. If he gave people cancer, would he be good? No. Does Jesus cause people to get sick? No. Why? Because he's a good shepherd. All right? So follow me here. A lot of people don't read the Bible. You know, a lot of Christians will say, well, I believe the Bible is the word of God and it's important. Do you read it every day? No. Why not? You can think about that. We believe it's the Word of God, and we believe it's the, you know, think about that. If we actually believe it's the Word of God, the God of the universe is speaking to me, we really believe that, then we would read it all the time, every day. Yes? But the fact that we don't means we really don't think it's important, or we don't believe it, or we think it's not good, it's not for me. I'm not spiritual enough. 
or I don't get it, or I don't really hear from God like other people hear from God, or I read the Bible stories and I go, well, that's nice for them, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not in that league. You ever feel that way? And I think a lot of us don't read it because we don't think it's for us, but I'm telling you it is for us. That Jesus leads you as much as he led David. That Jesus loves you as much as he loved Paul. Jesus loves you as much as he loved Billy Graham. That you're no different. The difference is the people you read about are folks who follow Jesus and trust him. They weren't perfect people, but they were sheep and they followed him and they walked into this life he had for them. It wasn't always pretty. Sometimes they had to go through the valley of the shadow of darkness when they went through it. And they kept their joy. Amen? A lot of it is because it's just a belief issue. You see, a lot of us, see, this is for us. God has a wonderful plan for us, a wonderful purpose for us. And the only way to get there is how? Follow. <laughs> He's not giving you directions. I always love it when people say, uh, well, I just want to know what God's purpose for me is. Have you ever asked that question? What is God, what is your grand purpose for me? Or how, have you ever asked this question? God, what do you want me to do? You ever asked that one? And you notice he never tells you. He never says, well, I'm glad you asked, Josh. I want you to go to build a church, and uh, I'm thinking you should go build it in Plant City. And you know, Why doesn't God tell me to do that? You know why? Because I'll go out and try to do it. And I will fail. Because it says in the Bible, that Jesus says, without me, you can't do anything. But he says, with me, you can do what? All things. So the reason why, because here's what Jesus is saying. Here's what I want you to do, Nicole. Are you ready? Follow me. Okay, let's try somebody else. Lisa. <laughs> Jesus wants, yeah, yeah, I have the answer. You're going, what does God want from me, Josh? And here it is. Uh, follow me. That's too easy. Murray. Maybe it's different. Murray, God has a word for you. And he says this, really difficult. Um, every day I want you to follow me. Does that seem too hard for people? Why is it so hard to follow God, Taylor? Because we're too busy trying to figure it all out. Do sheep figure things out? Sheep are pretty dumb. I hate to say this, Melissa, you're not dumb, but we're about as smart as sheep. <laughs> it's a pride issue, I think, believe. And I think it's good to be a sheep. We're going to look at it more in a second, but Jesus said, I'm a good shepherd. And why is that significant? Because if he's a good shepherd, he is. That means he's weak. What does a shepherd do? What does a shepherd do for the sheep? He cares for the sheep, yes. What else does a shepherd do for a sheep? Melissa, shout it out, honey. What? She's pointing. She called point and protect. What does a shepherd do? Facebook, put it in the comments. What does a, um, a shepherd do for the sheep? Feed and lead. Feed and lead. Derek, you had one the other day. What else was it? Oh, now I can't remember. It was really good. <laughs> it was really good, man. You're at our house. I can't remember. Protect. It was a rhyming one. Provide Perfect. and guide. I think it was like something yeah, like that. that. It was really good. like, yeah. it was like T.D. Jakes rhyming. It was like really good. <laughs> if I was a black minister, man, I'd I can do it, but I can't. Basically this, the shepherd does everything for the sheep. And, and not only does the shepherd do everything for the sheep, the shepherd lifts the sheep, the shepherd enjoys the sheep, and this one's going to be hard for a lot of you. The shepherd actually loves the sheep. That's why he does it. So Jesus is going, I'm a good shepherd, so I enjoy being your shepherd. I want you to imagine that. Jesus is talking to you right now and saying, I enjoy being your shepherd. I love it. I love spending time with you. I love guiding you. I love walking and protecting you. I love when you talk to me. I love that relationship. I love leading you. So Jesus is a good shepherd. He's taking care of all of our needs. And he's guiding our path. How many steps at a time? One step at a time. And he's feeding us all along the way. Does it get better than that? Christianity is not about finding a comfortable pew to sit on until you die. Christianity is about following Jesus and walking right into the life he's planned for you and walking right into eternity. But we have to be willing to follow. That's hard for Americans. Well, we like to be leaders. 
Uh, we don't have to be consultants. But it doesn't work that way. All we have to do is what? Follow. He's a good shepherd. So if he's a good shepherd and God is good, then that means the place he has taken you to, is it a good purpose for your life or a bad purpose? Yeah. It's better than you can think of. It's better than I can imagine. But all we got to do is walk it out with him. So what does this look like? Uh, Blair, would you show us the next verse? This is Psalm 23. The first verse says what? The Lord is what? My. Who's shepherd? My shepherd. When you're saying, Lord is my shepherd, you're basically saying, Lord, I'm laying down my life. I'm laying down my plans. I'm not going to figure it out no more. Lord God, I'm not even going to determine my next step. In obedience, I'm going to let you lead me. In obedience, I'm going to let you feed me. In faith, I'm going to let you heal me. And, and you know what, God? I'm going to let you do it all. When you say the Lord is my shepherd, that's a big statement. That makes God smile. Jesus, you are my shepherd. I'm willing to walk out of this cow pasture and walk into the place of you that you want me to be. What's the next verse? He's my shepherd to feed, to guide, to shield me. I shall not want. All right, Murray, shine that camera back over here. I'm going to destroy the consumer-driven church right now. Uh, Jesus is not here to meet all of your needs. Jesus is your need. You hear what I'm saying? Uh, it, it, it's not about you at all. It's all about Him. And because it's about Him, it actually is about your relationship with Him. When, the, when you say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Imagine a life you don't want anything. Who are the people that don't want anything in life? They are the people that are the most content. Why do they not want anything? Is it because they learn to, to live on little? You know what I mean? And You know, it's all right. I'm used to being hungry. I'm okay with being thirsty. I'm okay with, with not, you know, walking around with one shoe on. I'm all right. I've gotten used to it now. Why is it we don't want anything, Melissa? Because you don't have any needs because all your needs have been met. In other words, I've got everything. He's got me. What else is there to want? He's got all my needs covered. Amen? He knows my next job, my next breath, my everything. God's got it. What else is there outside? Of, you know, what else does God not control? The Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, I shall not want. Imagine how much of our lives are, are spent on pursuing stuff that we think we need, that we're afraid we're not going to get. People spend their entire lives, waste many years of their lives chasing money or chasing whatever they're chasing, but if they just follow Jesus, He'd give them everything they need. And, and it's like we're not even a living life. If you're always spending your life trying to survive or paycheck to paycheck or relationship to relationship or whatever it is, or, you know, we're trying to earn God's love and you already got God's love. I mean, you're wasting your life. You're not truly living. If you could realize that all your needs are already met in Christ, what would you do the rest of your time? I don't know. I don't know what life looks like outside survival. What? You'd be thriving. You'd be imagination, ideas. You'd be doing things you never thought of. Life would take on a whole different meaning regardless how old you are. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still and quiet waters. Does God lead you to anxiety? No. In fact, Melissa and I have always learned when you're making a decision, God will always lead you to a, to a place of joy and peace. God will never lead you to confusion. He will never lead you into fear. God does not give fear. But God always gives peace and joy. That's how you know it's God. You'll, you'll be going, do I go this way? And God will give that overwhelming peace and joy that passes understanding. And you go, that's it. Because that's the still waters. That's the green pastures. I get to lie down. If a sheep is lying down, that means that sheep can rest. Now, a lot of you out there in Facebook land in this room, you haven't rested for years. But you can actually rest. Truly rest. Think about that word rest. We don't know what that means. But to truly rest. To rest while you're working. To rest in your relationships. Think about that. To no longer strive, but to be in a state of rest at all times. That's peace. 
That's peace. He refreshes and restores my soul. I love that. Now, I don't know about you, but I want everybody in Facebook, I want everybody in this room to, to go way back in your mind in your life. I want you to imagine the time of your life before you ever had any pain. Can you imagine a time in your life before you were ever hurt? Can you imagine a time in your life before you were ever disappointed or lied to? Is there a point, if you go back in your mind, can you, as if you're a child, whatever it is, is there a point in your life before anything ever happened bad to you? Now I want you to imagine you do find that little person. Well, when God says, I'm here to restore your soul, it doesn't mean that God is taking you back to your best memory. It means that God is taking your soul, He's restoring your life to a point where it's never been before, better than you've ever imagined. See, God not only heals you, but He redeems you. God, when you bring Him, when you follow Him, He's taken all of you. All of your mistakes, all of your past, all of your worries, everything you disappoint, everything you think about, every wrong turn, everything you stepped in, and God... And he's so wonderful, he actually cleans you up and he turns all that around to, to, to glory. And he restores your soul. He, he makes you to a person you never imagined. In fact, you're being transformed from glory to glory, the Bible says. You're not getting older, you're actually getting younger. Rich Mullins always talked, he had a song that says, Growing Young. You know, and we are growing young. If you're, if you're walking in faith, you're not getting old. You're getting younger because you're being transformed and, and, and transformed to the image of Jesus himself the older you get. Isn't that beautiful? Life will wear you down and beat you up, but the Holy Spirit will give you life, the joy of peace, and restore you. Man, that's the promise. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know what a path does? A path shows you the way out or the way to go. A path will always lead you from where you are to somewhere else. And a lot of us are looking for a path in life. Some people feel lost like I don't have a path or it's in a circle. But Jesus says, I'll give you right paths, righteous paths, good paths. It'll be very clear. And in fact, he'll order your steps. Isn't that awesome? And then what happens? Even though... Now, Here's the big what ifs. Even though I walk through the vow, through the sunless valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You little sheep, you're going through the darkest valley. You can't even see the sun anymore, but you're not afraid. Why? For you are with me. Who's with me? Jesus is. Jesus is. Have you ever been to a point in your life where you feel like you can't see the sun? People talk the light of the <laughs> My dad posted this thing. Jack Loudonbilt, his name is on Facebook. He's funny. And he posted this thing. He said, uh, due to electricity and budget cuts, the, we had to turn off the light at the end of the tunnel. That's kind of funny. You chuckle. That's what happened to my dad. Post up. We kind of go, ah. I'm just kidding. We do laugh. But it's not that way at all, right? He says right here that even though we don't even see where we're going our next step, we know that he's with us. And because of that, we're not afraid. He says, your rod and your staff, they protect me. They guide me. They comfort and console me. And then I love this one. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> That's awesome. There's this big table, and you get to sit there and feast. If you're sitting there and eating to your, you know, your belly pops you know, in front of all your enemies, that means you're not anxious. It also means you're not bitter. It also means that you feel when you see your enemies, you love them. And you know why? Because the fact he sets a table out, you know what it means? It means there's plenty of room for everybody to come join me at this table. Amen. There's plenty of food. Please come, enemy, come be my friend. I'm going to love you right now. I don't have any grudges. I'm not, I'm not going to get even with you. In fact, God's already taken care of me. I want you to know this God that I love. You're inviting them to sit down with you. Isn't that beautiful? Enemies, come on, sit down and have a feast. That's beautiful. You have anointed my you have anointed and refreshed my hand with oil, my cup overflows. Melissa, she explains it so beautifully. You gotta follow me on this one. We're almost done. I didn't know this, but my beautiful wife is smart. You want to explain this cup analogy you want me to do it? Now, I've never been to the Middle East. I've been to Middle Georgia, which is nothing like the Middle East, right? 
but we do have sweet tea. That's different. But what happens? Listen to this. You sit at a table, and they're happy to see you. So you fill up your glass with a drink. And they say, we're so glad you're here. Have some drink, right? And if they like you, and you're, you start drinking your drink, they'll say, no, 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 keep filling it up, right? Because if they keep filling up your drink, that means they want you to stay. But let's just say they get a little tired of it. It's getting late. Uh, and then all of a sudden your, your cup gets down to half full. They don't fill it up again. That's your way to know, oh, it's time to go. They're being polite. Okay. They're saying, hey, uh, we don't want you to leave, but we need to leave. Right? So what it's saying right here, it says, my cup overflows, that you're always walking with the table. That God never wants you to leave. That he loves you so much that your cup is overflowing. He just keeps pouring into it, and he doesn't stop. He's never tired of you. He doesn't say, that's enough, Brittany. You can leave now. He says, no, Brittany, you stay. You're my daughter. When can I leave? Never. Forever. I'm going to keep on filling your cup to overflowing, and it's going to get everywhere. That's how he feels about us. He's saying, you stay. You stay. You stay. You don't have to get up. This isn't when you come to church on Sunday. Good luck for the rest of the week. No, man, Jesus is going, man, I want you with me all the time. You're always welcome. Amen? That's a beautiful analogy. My wife's so smart. And it says this, Surely, goodness and mercy and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell forever throughout all my days in the house and in the presence of the Lord. Now, raise your hands. Facebook, hit like if you've done this. If you ever watched the Dukes of Hazzard, did you? You watched the Dukes of Magic, okay? So you understand, this is back before the days of political correctness. We didn't know what that was. We just liked watching the orange car. So you had the boys. Who were the boys? What were their names? There were four of them. John Schneider. John Schneider. Who's the other one? <laughs> Tom Lord Pat. Luke and Duke. Luke and Duke. And Luke and Duke. Thank you. Bo and Luke. Bo and Luke. Yeah, sorry. And Vincent Coy. <laughs> Bo and Luke, right? Are we all agreement? So Bo and Luke were in their orange car, and they're flying through these dirt roads, and it says, hey, who was chasing them? Sheriff Roscoe Pico Train. Roscoe and who? Yeah, man. Cletus, right? Enos, Cletus. Whatever. They're always being pursued. And what would he always say? He'd say, we're in hot pursuit. We're in hot pursuit of the boys, right? And so when you look at that word, follow me, it really means hot pursuit. I'm not saying that God talks country like I do. He might. Y'all are going to be surprised when you go to heaven. And Jesus says, walk home, y'all. Y'all are going to be shocked. Hey, you know what I mean? Because he did speak the common man language. You don't know that. I might be right. That's right. Yeah, y'all are going to be feeling silly if they're not kidding me. I'll, I'll translate for you what he's saying. But in, that, in the Hebrew word, it means, follow means, it, we can't translate it. We don't have an English word what it really means. What we think it means, it's, it's such a pursuit. It's, it's a, imagine um, somebody takes your child away from you, and you're pursuing that person, your child. That's a small picture of that word means. So God is passionately, fiercely in love, chasing you, pursuing you all the way, not just following you around. He's chasing you down with what? Goodness and mercy. God, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. I love you, I love you. God, I blew it, I forgive you. You know, we're running from God. He's chasing us. He's in hot pursuit. He's going, I love you. I've not changed my purpose for you. I am your good shepherd. You are my sheep. Come home. And he will not stop. He will not give up on you. You can doubt. You can have good days and bad days. But he always has a good day. He's always a good shepherd. And he's always chasing you. With what? Goodness and mercy. His goodness and his mercy. That's why he's a good shepherd. And that's why we're sheep. So we're going to pray right now for all the lost sheep that need to be found. You don't got Jesus. You didn't find, no one finds Jesus. He finds you. And here's the good news. If you're watching, you're watching this on Facebook, wherever you are, Jesus knows where you are. He knows. Because he's a good shepherd. You know what else a good shepherd does? A good shepherd knows where all those sheep are. He knows it. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Most of the time at a restaurant the other day, when we were leaving, and this lady was outside smoking her cigarette. She goes, y'all pastors? We're like, <laughs> we're looking around and going, yeah, we're pastors. No, you're not. And she, you know, she might have had some spirits. You know, I'll say that. 
And this other guy was saying that we knew him, and you're like, yeah, we realized she was talking about us. And then she goes, we're going to come to that church one day. My friend here, she's an atheist. That's why she can come too. And I started thinking about that. God loves those two sheep. And he knows exactly where they are. He put us there. So see, see, God knows where all the sheep are. And he loves every one of them. Every one of them. He loves them. He loves them. And he knows where your daughter is. He knows that. that he, she loves creation, right? You know what she's going to find out? The person behind creation. And she's going to love them. You see, he knows where she is. And he knows where you are, Nicole. He knows where you are, Melissa. He knows where you are. He knows where I am. And you know what's beautiful? He talks to us. He actually, God talks to people. Let me get crazy here. He does, Roger. He talks to me. He talks to you. He talks to all of us. And uh, next week we're going to talk about how, how to hear his voice. Did you tell him what the pool story Come on up here. What did you say? Did you tell him what the pool story what story? The pool story. No, oh, I, I got to tell a pool story. Thank you, Derek. To show that God does talk to us. I was a youth minister many years ago. This would be very brief. I, won't, I, won't, I can't use his name because of what he does for a living now. But I was a youth minister. We had a youth lock-in. A lock-in is a horrible idea. It's where you get a bunch of teenagers <laughs> together, adults, and no one sleeps. It's the worst idea that ever been. It's not even in the Bible. Well, it's a bad idea. <laughs> so we decided to have a lock in with a bunch of other, you've got two or three hundred teenagers, a bunch of youth ministers that at the YMCA. What's that? Because that was the bad idea. How many? Oh, yeah, see, anytime have more than two teenagers, too many, <laughs> my opinion. We didn't have Facebook and all that stuff back then, thank God. But what happened was uh, we went to the YMCA. It's a big old YMCA with a swimming pool, you know, volleyball courts, basketball courts. So my job was to. Um, wander around and catch the couples making out. My job. I was like the anti-Cupid. You know what I'm saying? I was looking for Cupid. My job was to kill that little joker. You know what I mean? Stomping out Cupid. So I was, I was walking around looking for Cupid. And on the way there, I was listening to a preacher named, named Charles Stanley. He's like, you want to hear God's voice on the radio? And I said, yes, Lord, I want to hear your voice. I didn't know what I was saying. And all of a sudden, I, I'm standing there, we're walking through the volleyball court, me and this one kid. And all of a sudden, I hear inside my heart a voice. Go to the pool. And I'm thinking, I don't want to go to the pool. Okay, I better go to the pool. I don't know what's going on. It wasn't audible. So I went to the pool, and a bunch of kids were in the pool. And I went over to the deep end where the kids were playing, and I'm standing over there with them, and all of a sudden, that voice was stern in my heart, and it said, go to the shallow end. I went to the shallow end of the pool, and I looked down there. I had this one teenager, and we'll call him Billy. Billy was six foot eight, big guy, tall guy, and he had a snorkel set on. He was kind of my, my ranger kind of guy, you know what I mean? Every youth group has that one kid who's like gung ho. He was laying in the bottom of the pool and I thought he was messing around with me. So I jumped into the three foot to, to go along with it and I pushed his body <laughs> and all of a sudden he, he was blue. He had passed out and drowned in the water. I pulled him out of the pool, this big guy, I just threw him out of the pool, started doing CPR, and I remember the lifeguard, she was screaming, oh my gosh, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, the lifeguard. So I'm like, get her out of here, this is crazy. I'm doing I'm, every breath, all this horrible stuff was coming out of his mouth, and I was, man, I, I wasn't even, you're in automatic mode. And I'm praying, I'm not even really praying, like God, just God, help me. And uh, everybody's freaking out, crying, there's no pulse, and we kept doing CPR, probably the the uh, paramedics showed up and they relieved me. I was, it felt like I was there forever. And they had a very weak pulse and they said, you did everything you could. And I left and we all were going to go to the hospital we had to call the parents. And the parents already lost a daughter before. This was their last living child. And he was supposed to graduate that year. So we're going there and we're calling the minister and I, you know. I remember we were sitting there and all the teenagers were showing up and we had a really big youth, a huge youth group. It was a big church I worked at. And they're all piling in there, crying, and uh, everybody loved Billy. And I remember everybody's going, he's dead, he's not going to live. And the parents even says, Josh, thank you for pulling my son out of there. But, you know, if he doesn't make it, we don't blame you. You, you might have given him a chance. And I remember this one lady, she said, don't speak death. Or we speak life. 
come with me. We went to the chapel with some other people and we started singing praises to God. We started worshiping God. And while I was worshiping God, I didn't know what was going on. I saw something in my mind. It was this red thread about to break. And God told me, pray that it doesn't break. I don't know what I was praying for. So I was like, all right, Lord, don't let that. And also that thread got thicker. Don't know what I was seeing. And uh, long story short, they got a pulse back. His brain was, both lungs had collapsed. His brain was uh, really swollen. And they said, if he does live, he'll be a vegetable. And we didn't receive that. And we said, well, God, you know, no, we don't believe that at all. So we just kept praying and praying. And sure enough, one day, we were praying for him. And the parents were with, uh, the parents were with our senior pastor. And they were praying over Billy. They had their hands over their praying over him because they were praying, should they pull the plug out? Because it had been a couple weeks and, you know, wasn't looking good. And in the middle of that, in the middle of them praying over him, and we were all in the church praying for him as well. You know what happened? He woke up. He woke up in the middle of that, had a feeding tube, and he was mouthing the words, what happened? It was a miracle. An absolute miracle. God healed him. Not only that, there was no brain damage. He was perfectly fine, like nothing ever happened, and God totally saved that young man. But if I had not heard God's voice, I'd be telling you about a funeral service, about a teenager I had around the pool. He is a good shepherd, folks. Amen. 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 And he knew where Billy was. You know what I think God's doing a lot of times? I think, you know, a lot of people think you have to be special for God to use. I don't think you have to be special at all. I just think you gotta be say, Lord, well, if you want to talk to somebody, talk to me. I think God just wants to talk to somebody who's listening. And then it's just very simple. And he wants to tell you what to do to encourage somebody. Or you don't know. You might be saving somebody's life. Get, but most people just aren't listening. I honestly think that's why so many bad things happen in this world. Because a lot of Christians just aren't listening. It's not God's fault. He's a good shepherd. But he needs people to hear his voice. And when we hear his voice, we obey. It's not figuratively, folks. It's, it's literal. And next week, we're going to be talking about how to hear His voice. I can't get more simple than that. We're going to be teaching from the Word of God, but today we have to talk about He's a shepherd. And next week, he, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. I've heard His voice, and, it's, and I've heard Him a lot more since then. A lot more. It's scary how much we've heard Him talk to us. And it's almost getting where we don't hear from Him and we get nervous. And uh, so, thank you, Derek, for listening to God to remind me to tell that story. Amen? And that goes along with you were saying, Lisa. Yeah. That does fit. She, was, she came up to me and she said, what was that? Come up here real quick. Facebook, I want you to meet somebody. <laughs> and then we'll end after this. Come on, right here. Right, stay right here so they can see you. You were saying about God was speaking to you very loudly. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, wait. You got to look at the camera, too. And use this. Okay. And you're going to close us. I like that. All yeah, right. So when we were when we were worshiping after prayer, I remembered the the passage in I think it's in Psalms. Help me, tell me if I'm wrong. Where David is saying, "Where can I go from your spirit, and how can I hide from your eyes?" And today, as New Testament believers, not only does He go before us, but because He dwells in us, He goes before us and He's with us. And to follow that up even one little step more, when the children of Israel were wandering through the desert trying to get out of slavery and out of bondage and to the promised land, he led them with a pillar of fire and the security of a cloud to protect them and to lead them, which goes along with this Psalm 23 passage. <clears throat> and one other little awesome picture that I saw in your daughter tonight when, when you were singing when we were praying, she came up and she had the freedom to operate within the presence, the confines of this building. And she was around and she was picking up toys and looking at them. When she was the absolute most still was when she was standing right there beside her mom. When she was by her parent, she was completely calm. And I think when we're talking about pursuing peace, which brings the joy that you're, you're talking about, when we're in the presence of God, our Father, our parent, 
That's when we can be still and fully learn how to trust that he will lead us, he will guide us, he will protect us. He has done all those things. We have to learn how to walk into it and walk with him to follow him. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. So go in peace. <laughs> Amen. We can drop the video there now. So, uh...